Hi, everybody. Welcome to our second session that Colin is going to be delivering for us. And um, Colin, thank you very much. You're going to be covering connectivity and communication with us today. And um, yeah, as I mentioned earlier, I've really been looking forward to this session because uh, connectivity and communication are just so important for us as human beings. And um, what I do is that I read a lot of uh, biographies. And uh, a few years ago, I read a biography of, um, of um, Isaac Newton. And it was just so interesting because what they would do is that they would write letters. You know, they would write letters to each other, all these scientists and physicists and all of that. You know, they were connected around the world, but it was all snail mail. You know, it was all these wonderful, wonderful letters that, of course, get auctioned nowadays for a fortune. Um, you know, but uh, the thing is that they, for them, they couldn't, they couldn't develop anything in isolation. They had to be connected to like-minded people, um, and they had to communicate, and they had to share their knowledge. And so it, it's something that we quite often take for granted nowadays. Um, and so, yeah, uh, the communication is absolutely key for us as human beings. It's the, it's the glue that keeps our societies and our families together. So Colin, thank you once again. And I'd like to, I'd like to hand over to you. Excellent. Um, thank you very much, uh, Judy, for that lovely introduction. Um, and uh, also thank you to, to everybody for making time to attend uh, this on, on, a, on a science um, Saturday, uh, ultimately. Um, I guess I am going to try and quickly share my screen. Uh, if you could just give me a second. That. Okie dokie. Great. So um, I, I thought it very apt to, to basically have this uh, picture from the Sistine Chapel uh, done by, by Michelangelo. And I think, uh, you know, for the longest time, um, man has always been trying to, to connect, uh, you know, so it started off with communications, right? So human, the human beings and as a species, um, we are quite gregarious and uh, communications is, is hugely important to us. And of course, back uh, in, in the dawn of times, um, we, we lived in smaller communities and communications wasn't uh, too much of an issue until um, you know, somebody from the village decided to travel afar. Um, and then the only forms of communications were, you know, um, different types of, of, of elements, etc. So, so things like um, smoke signals. You know, I believe that the uh, the Native Americans, um, you know, used to communicate from one hill across through to the other hill by just sending out smoke signals. You know, and then it sort of uh, evolved into um, obviously sending out mail um, and uh, you know delivering messages, etc. So. There's a whole long, long history just around uh, connectivity itself. Um, I just want to quickly confirm my um, that this is currently in full screen, uh, Judy or Brittany. Yes, yes, it is. Okay, okay. excellent. Um, so um, I've actually prepared a deck which is quite large. This is quite a quite a bit of information in here, but not necessarily going to cover um, everything that's within that. Um, 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 there are sort of some very key points that I want to bring out from, from this particular session. Um, and of course, post the session, uh, the entire deck, uh, including slides that we may not have covered, will also be available uh, for you to sort of uh, peruse through, etc. Right. So I have a very broadly, uh, we are going to cover elements of um, the um, electromagnetic spectrum. We're going to cover some uh, wave theory. Um, if you if you were an attendant uh, in my power course, uh, you would find that I love introducing elements of uh, of mathematics as well in here. So so no surprises if you see uh, a couple of equations um, on here, and uh, of course we'll we'll um, have a few questions for you um, for the for the assignment as well. Um, we'll also cover things around 
radio waves uh, will give you a very quick, uh, you know, for me, this is a very deep uh, passion, which is the internet. Uh, you know, I'd like to sort of test your understanding as well to see what, what do you know about the internet, you know, especially when you are taking your, your kits and you're connecting up to, to Kibana. Um, do you understand how that information flow is actually uh, going through, et cetera? You'll also find that, uh, you know, the internet has evolved over time to actually become a communication tool today, right? Uh, we're, we're talking to each other right now through the, the miracle of the internet. We're communicating with each other. We have the ability to transmit uh, video, audio, um, pictures, and that type of thing. So, which is why I think no, no discussion around connectivity and communications uh, can exclude uh, something around the internet. Um, then the, the, the UN SDG 7 element will talk a little bit about um, how would that sort of apply uh, in terms of what we're trying to do with the and having an understanding of the different types of connectivity options. Um, of, co of course, from an Intel set perspective, we'll, we'll cover a little, um, a few elements around satellite, satellite communications, and we'll talk about the future um, of satellite communications uh, going, um, you know, from, from that standpoint. Um, then I'd like to sort of, you know, as usual, have a little um, discussion around uh, Mars, um, and, and more specifically uh, around communications and, and, and connectivity. And then, of course, the questions and assignments at the end. Typically, I, I suspect that we might not have time to run through uh, questions and answers, but um, certainly that will be placed um, um, onto the Canvas platform uh, for us to sort of interact on. Um, just the other point as well, and, and it, it sort of stuck with me uh, when Judy um, initially mentioned this um, at the outset of the course, and, and she mentioned that you, know, you as, as learners um, are actually responsible for your own education. Um, I think the role that uh, myself, Judy, and my other co-hosts uh, play is so we sort of uh, here to facilitate conversation and we were sort of here to facilitate the learning process. Um, they certainly were not able to cover uh, you know, every single aspect of every single sort of topic ultimately. So there is, there is sort of an expectation that uh, you know, we hope there are elements in, in here that um, um, stimulates you to basically go and read up more and, and learn more about it. And, and certainly we'd love for you to bring back um, that information and, and share it uh, on the Canvas platform. Um, but also, you know, in that spirit throughout this, um, this course, you'll find that I've kind of taken a slightly different approach in that um, I'm gonna be asking a lot of questions and, uh, you know, I'd love for you to be a lot more interactive, um, you know, so if you can cover elements of, of theory as well, uh, I'd, I'd absolutely love that. But of course, you know, I'll sort of guide, guide the conversation ultimately. So we're expecting today to be, uh, you know, uh, a little bit more interactive. So, you know, please do keep your microphones at hand. Uh, I'd love to see you on video as well. Um, you know, so if you need to do up your hair or jump out of your pajamas, uh, go ahead and do that very, very quickly. Um, so um, with that, I would like to ask this first question. Um, I'm inviting anybody to basically please um, switch on your video, tell me about what you see um, up on the screen. And of course, you know, uh, try and relate it back to the um, the discussion today. Reza, you've got your hand up. Um, welcome to open up your video as well, please, Reza. Uh, morning, everyone. Go for it, uh, Reza. Okay. The first thing from this image that, I, that came to mind is something like a ripple effect. That was the first thing that came to mind for me. Excellent. And to uh, tie it to connectivity and communication, I'm just thinking about it. Okay. Um, great. Thank you for that, uh, Reza. Any anybody else would like to contribute to, to what Reza sort of laid as a foundation? Um, no need to raise your hand. You could just sort of switch on your video, turn on your microphone, and go for it. Anybody else? 
Okay, so I think maybe maybe I'll sort of get that uh, going. Um, so ultimately, what to exactly to to what Reza said, right? This is ultimately a ripple effect. Um, a lot of you have sort of sat uh, in in a, in a swimming pool, or you have had a cup of tea, and you've dropped something into the cup of tea, and you start to see these concentric circles start to build out from the middle of where the disturbance happened, and it moves out towards the edge. Okay, so so yes, we we see that as a ripple, but ultimately ultimately what's happening is that we're seeing a wave starting to form, right? Um, and essentially what this does, you'll, you'll notice that this particular picture has a little droplet dropping in the middle, right? And it's basically in this particular um, axis, your, your Y axis, but the wave starts to propagate in that, um, that particular uh, axis, so your X axis, okay? Um, and you'll find that the water itself is actually not moving, right? But what's actually moving across is the fact that there was a disturbance in this particular angle in that sort of um, uh, motion, uh, I guess. Um, and there's a disturbance that continues to move along in that particular direction, right? And, and that ultimately is what um, a wave is all, all about. Um, a wave is essentially the propagation of energy moving through a particular medium, okay? So I'm intentionally using some of these words, um, you know, so, so propagation is the motion of, of something in a particular um, direction. And uh, medium, um, maybe if I could just ask, does anybody want to take a stab at what medium typically means? Maybe give us a few examples. Um, like I said, no need to raise a hand, just uh, go ahead and, and shout that out. Uh, medium, mm -hmm. did you say? What is a medium? Um, a medium is something which acts as a point between transfer. So you have something happening on one end. It goes through a medium, say water or stone or something, and comes out possibly different on the other end. Full marks. Uh, um, that was Declan, right? Um, yeah, full marks there. Uh, Ruby, go ahead. Um, similar to what Declan said, when you talk about waves and stuff, for example, sound waves, then your median would, median would be the air because that is what the sound waves travel through. And then the, I think it's like the density or something of the medium depends on the size of the wave. Uh, fantastic. Uh, you know, uh, so, so you both are exactly on, on the right path, right? So, so typically um, a medium is something through which um, waves can actually travel. Um, and I love that last point, uh, Ruby, that um, you'll find that the different, so, so the plural of medium is media. Um, different types of media have different types of density, and therefore they affect the way different waves sort of travel through them, right? Um, so, so for example, just utilizing this particular example here, um, waves traveling through water might uh, travel through sort of mud, you know, very different because the density and the two types of, of media is basically different. But more on that a little bit later on, and we actually have an equation um, that, that I'll share with you in terms of it. Um, so here's, here's the next question. You know, I've often um, sat, for those of you sitting at, uh, in the coastal regions or those of you that have been out to, to the coastal side, um, have seen many of this. And I've, and I've wondered if you, if you thought about how are these formed? Um, anybody would like to would like to take a stab at that? Uh, do you mean waves in the ocean or just waves generally? Because waves in the ocean are caused by wind. So it is friction between wind and the surface of the water. And that's how they form. Excellent. Um, so I think um, I think I will give you um five out of ten um for that so so you've given us the first element in terms of wind starts to blow uh, across the ocean and it creates these little um, um sort of wave lips uh, on the surface of the ocean itself um but why why is it that we see these big curls happening closer to to the shore but but not not typically um you know, everywhere across the entire ocean.
Um, ju just a possibility. I'm not sure 100%, but could it be due to like a slope in land from um, sea level land to like down bottom of the ocean land? And then this water plane is being pushed up by wind upwards onto the slope, causing it to crawl over. Declan, you are you are very very close close to that. So so I'm very happy with that answer and also the previous answer. Maybe just to sort of close that off. So you'll find that um, when wind blows across the surface of the ocean, it starts to create these little ripples, right? But as that wave continues, and like we said, it starts to propagate um, through the medium of the ocean, right? Now we all know that the bed of the ocean starts to sort of change, right? But as it gets closer to, let's say land is here and the ocean bed is somewhere here, as it gets closer to uh, the shore, it then starts to do that, right? It's gonna have to meet uh, at some point. Now, because there's a slope in this particular uh, area here, you'll find that the waves, one of the very, very key elements that you're gonna learn about waves is that waves also carry energy. Right, that, that is a very key aspect to understand uh, around waves. Um, and let's say it's carrying a specific amount of energy as it's coming closer to this slope and we're getting to the shore, right? Um, for this amount um, of water, water area, it's carrying a certain amount, a fixed amount of energy. But as it starts to get closer to the shore, you'll find that this, um, this sort of distance between the top and the actual floor bed starts to decrease quite rapidly. And because there's a decrease um, in, in that sort of um, space, but there's the energy is still the same, right? It's still being propagating the same amount of energy. That en energy needs to go somewhere, okay? And what we start to see is a bulge uh, essentially building up on the top. And ultimately what we see coming crashing uh, onto the shore is this lovely big wave, okay? Um, so please go ahead and, and like I said, go ahead and shout out answers. No need to raise your hands uh, as I'm sort of progressing through these. Now, there are various different types of waves um, that we're gonna, we're gonna sort of hone in on a very specific area here, but just so that we know that there are quite a few of these different types of waves, right? Um, so you have mechanical waves, um, seismic waves, and you have electromagnetic waves, okay? Um, I'm going to basically very quickly cover the mechanical wave side. Um, from a mechanical wave perspective, I think a lot of you know that there are two types of waves, longitudinal and transversal. Um, so we'll, we'll sort of dig into that a little bit just now. But the water wave, as we can see, is considered to be a transverse wave, okay? And that's gonna be a clue uh, to you because there's a question coming up uh, straight after this slide. Um, whereas a longitudinal wave is a sound wave. Okay, so I want you to start thinking about um, why are these two different? You know, why is a sound wave a longitudinal wave? And why is a water wave a transversal wave? And, and what makes them different? Okay, um, onto the other side, you'll see we'll go into quite a lot of detail around electromagnetic waves, okay, which we will so we'll, we'll cover in slightly more detail. Um, and then, of course, you know, within the seismic uh, waves, we, we know that. This is typically related to um, the movement um, of different plates and tectonic plates um, of the Earth, etc. Um, so, more specifically, um, this is this is almost a a giveaway, right? Um, would anybody like to take a stab at explaining the difference between a, a longitudinal wave and a transverse wave? And if you could give me an example of each. Um, I can try. <laughs> yeah, go for it. Um, so a longitudinal wave is a sound wave and it's kind of, it refers to the pressure of the air in a way. So when you look at the top photo, when the um, like red dots are close together, that's more of like a high, um, like a higher compression. And then the other ones are a lower compression and I've forgotten what they're called. Um, I'm thinking, I think it's like, it's like regions of compression or something. Yes. I'm aware, oh, and then of rarefaction or something. And yes. then um, 
a transverse wave is more of the um like it kind of shows like the frequency or something of like actual not really actual waves but more ah uh, this is really going back in my mind um you're doing it's, fine uh, yeah. <laughs> it's vibrations it's um okay. it's like then you have like the top and the bottom then you have like the trough and the peak yes good. i don't know how to, yeah i don't know how to explain so, it so maybe can you can you offer me uh, an example of each um well the, the top one is a sound wave so sound and then um the bottom one like you could do like a regular wave or you could do um yeah, like you could talk about a, live, a loudspeaker for the top one, and then you could talk about a regular wave um, for the bottom Good. one. Good, excellent. I, I like it. That's great. Would anybody like to sort of build on that or offer more examples? I feel like the, the longitudinal mm -hmm. the longitudinal wave can be the, the disturbance travel in the same direction as the movement of energy while transverse wave travel in a perpendicular direction, the disturbance. For the transverse wave, I can give an example for a rope when you're like uh, going up and down, the wave, the wave kind of travels. Lovely. Um, is it, is it Al Albina that was speaking? Albina, uh, okay, so I think maybe we've just lost your audio, but I, I loved, I loved your explanation. It was, it was really great, um, and I loved your examples as well. Fantastic. So maybe just to sum up here, longitudinal waves <coughs> basically move in the direction of the disturbance. You know, so I like exactly what what Albina said. Now, if you look at your your loudspeaker, right, a loudspeaker sort of moves like this. And the sound waves start to propagate in that direction. Okay, and you're able to hear something. Um, in some in some instances, instances, if uh, a lot of you play a lot of loud music through through your high five, um, right, and you stand in front of your speaker, you can actually feel um, those sound waves impacting against yourselves. Um, the next wave, also like the example about, um, well, we've seen it uh, with wave, an actual wave across the ocean, uh, as well as sort of moving a rope. Right? And you'll find the propagation of the wave is perpendicular to the motion of the actual disturbance itself. Okay. One very interesting example at the top. I don't know if a lot of you have sat in traffic, right? And you're going down this, this highway with, um, with somebody, you, you, you're either driving or you're sitting in a car, and you suddenly notice that all the cars come to a standstill, right? And then all of a sudden it opens up again and you and you look around and there's nothing on the road there's no there's no accidents um there's nothing on the road that that's slowing everybody down but you start to find that at some point in the road everybody sort of slows down and in some cases almost stop and then at some points they then move again and you start driving off and then later on you start to slow down right do you see what's actually happening so ultimately driving in traffic is actually a type of longitudinal wave, right? Because you're finding that there's a compression sort of happening and there's an expansion sort of area. Um, and, 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 you know, love to spend some more time with you and tell you exactly what causes that. But essentially we're experiencing a longitudinal wave uh, in, in traffic itself. Um, right, so in terms of the electromagnetic effect, right, as we're gonna sort of um, transition into the electromagnetic spectrum, et cetera, um, the, a lot of us know that um, if you have a piece of wire and you start to run, I think we covered this element in our power uh, lecture initially, when you start to conduct wire um, current through a wire, that wire then starts to give off um, a magnetic field. It generates a magnetic field, right? So from that perspective, we know that anything that is carrying current is going to generate a magnetic field, okay? Um, and also in reverse, we've also found that if you've got an existing magnetic field um, formed by the various types of magnets, um, and if you interrupt the field with a piece of wire, okay, 
measured at the end, ends of those two wires, you will actually start to see that there's a current that has been induced, right? So there's sort of a, a, a dual nature in terms of what can actually happen uh, from a magnetic field perspective. So very, very sort of quick uh, introduction there, but again, just go ahead and shout out any questions or comments that you'd like to make as I'm sort of running through these, uh, these various slides. Righto, now, um, if you recall, I spoke about um, that there are various different types of waves, okay? We spoke about the me mechanical waves and we spoke about different examples there. We then spoke about a uh, the little bit about seismic waves. Um, and then of course you've got the electromagnetic waves, okay? Um, so essentially electromagnet the electromagnetic spectrum is basically this entire range of, of waves. And you'll start to find that it is, it is sort of um, mapped against the frequency um, of the waves. Okay, so we're gonna cover it just now exactly what is frequency, but looking at the, 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 the wave pattern sort of in the middle, you'll start to find that the waves are longer Okay, at the lower end of the frequency spectrum. And then as it gets to the higher end of the frequency spectrum, it starts to increase. Okay, so just sort of keep that picture in your mind um, when we sort of get to a discussion around what that specifically means. Um, but I want to also just touch on the scale of, uh, of frequency. So you'll find that frequency is measured in a unit called Hertz. Okay. Um, and, and Hertz is basically the number of cycles per second. Um, and we'll, we'll cover what that is just now. But just looking at the scale, okay, um, you'll find uh, it starts off on your left-hand side by saying 1 khz, 1 mhz, 1 ghz, th, ph, eh, zh. Would anybody like to offer um, an explanation of that? Tell us what that is. And you'll find that the this particular so sorry go for it is it Al Al Alvina no it's me Ruby <laughs> Ruby okay cool sorry the green box is highlighting <laughs> it's the go for it um so like you're talking about the k um hertz and the m hertz and everything yes. um so that is talking about like the size of the hertz I'm not sure I know all of them but I know that the m is mega and the um g is giga and then the one is terra um and oh uh, but uh, the other ones here and the K is kilo. So the first one is a thousand hertz. The next one's, um, I think a million hertz or something. And then the next one, I don't know how many more adds. So it adds another three. So it's like, I don't know what these numbers are, but I know it's basically increasing a very, very large amount. It goes by 10 to the power of three is like timesing by a thousand each time. Okay, well, you, you you hit the nail on the head, and that's exactly what I was looking to to get from this. So, so thanks, Ruby. Um, so 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 Ruby pointed out that, and, and she named a few of these. Right. So these are called um, when a lot of you get into engineering, um, you're going to cover multiples and sub multiples. Okay, and, and what multiples and sub multiples do for us, it helps us to um, to refer to a very very large number by just a name. Right, so starting from the, the left-hand side, you have 10 to the three, okay? In the, middle, in the middle, you'll find it starts with 10 to the, th to the three, then it goes to 10 to the six, 10 to the nine, 10 to the 12, then to 15, then 18, then 21. The common pattern there is obviously, you'll see that every, every multiple is multiplied up by three, which is a thousand, 10 to the three is ultimately a thousand. So these particular multiples, we're grouping um, multiples of thousand, uh, you know, and to basically fit them onto the scale. And it starts off by um, kilo, then it goes to mega, giga, terra, peta, exa, and zeta. Okay, so um, you'll find that uh, these multiples are basically applied in anything, um, in anything that is really scientific. Um, has anybody heard these multiples being applied to any other um, area or metric? Uh, maybe a few examples. You're welcome to shout them out. Uh, bytes, uh, yes. kilobytes, megabytes, gigabytes, uh, terabytes, petabytes, eta, eta, 
No, exa. Exa, exa. Exabytes and zettabytes. I mean, obviously, the, the higher we go, the harder it is to store something like that. But in a theoretical sense, people use zettabytes or exabytes. Excellent. Excellent. I love it. And any other any other metrics anyone else could think of? Um, you can use it for weight. You can say like milligram and you can say kilogram. Um, you can also, if you were to go like even like lighter, you could say like nanogram or microgram. Uh -huh. Excellent. Excellent. And, and I, I, it's interesting that you stopped at kilogram, right? Because not many of us have heard of a megagram and a gigagram. Um, you kind of talk about tons at that point and stuff. You don't exactly. really talk about exactly. megagrams. Correct. Look in the scientific uh, communities, you know, there are uh, certainly um, elements, you know, as we sort of look into space as well, um, you're going to get things that go very, very dense and very, very heavy, um, you know, and you can potentially move to, to high orders of the scale. And yeah, so what you touched on there, Ruby, was we're looking here in terms of as you multiply by a thousand, but there are some some elements that are quite light and you look at what happens when you divide it by a thousand right so they also have names and and they go if i can remember correctly it's milli micro nano pico femto eto right so there are multiple names that also you could refer to uh, different types of, of things that go smaller um so you'll find that moving down to the, the next area, we talk about different bands of um, the electromagnetic spectrum. Uh, we have a broad area called the radio spectrum. Okay, and then we sort of move into the visible light um, sort of area. And then we move to the X-rays and gamma rays, etc. cetera. Um, so on the radio side, yeah, you'll see we'll cover those elements uh, shortly. But yeah, so I mean, in, in terms of visible light, um, you'll find that light itself sort of takes um, a very, very small element of that entire uh, type of uh, electromagnetic spectrum. And what that really tells us is we call it visible light because that's the only, uh, only bits that we can physically see with, with our eyes, right? Um, and I've always found it interesting um, that as I, as I stand here waving my, my hand around, et cetera, Right, there's a whole bunch of stuff and things flying through uh, through um, the air um, that consist of all of these different types of electromagnetic waves coming to us. Um, I think it's important to also note that we get um, waves being emitted by a whole range of different things. It might just be uh, there are naturally occurring elements uh, out there. There are radio frequency um, sort of um, electrical equipment um, all around you, things like your computers, things like your, your radio, things like your television, uh, your, your lights, um, anything that is electrical, because of the electromagnetic effect, um, we can expect them to, to sort of give off, um, um, you know, certain, um, certain amounts of uh, ele electromagnetic uh, radiation. Um, just around the, the light um, area as well, um, there's a cool experiment I'd like for you all to try in your spare time, right? So uh, a lot of you have this. Uh, goodness, I'm gonna quickly turn off my blur. Uh, just give me a second. <clears throat> I can't, I can't really get that just yet. Okay, well. I can I help, go. Colin? Um, yes. What I can do is I, I can pin you. Why don't I pin you on the on on your video? Let's see. Otherwise, unless you st if you stop sharing, um, then yes. I can pin you on the video. Okay, great. Let's do. Ah, here we go. That that actually helps just by stopping the share. Uh, let's get to my. Background and filters. No, okay, there we go. That should do it. Excellent. Yeah. Um, so a lot of you have this lying around. Okay. And when you're looking at this and you push buttons, etc., 
you can't really see what's what's going on, right? So that's the little window up front and you can't really see it. But if you point it at your cell phone camera, right? Uh, and actually it works with your computer camera as well. Here you go, I'm pressing the button now. Okay, utilizing your um, your computer camera or your cell phone camera, you're now able to see that there is there is something happening there. But if you're looking at this with your visible eye, our eyes are not able to detect um, infrared, um, whereas these other devices can. So that's that's probably something that you could welcome to try in your spare time. Um, let's just jump back into this. Um, Great. So essentially what you know, to summarize exactly what's happening on the um, electromagnetic spectrum, we can see that it's a way of representing the entire range of waves that we're seeing uh, or that are available. And it's typically ordered in increasing frequency and decreasing wavelength. Okay. So I mean, just to, based on that, what, um, can anybody offer a reason for that? Why is it uh, increasing frequency and decreasing wavelengths? Is there a relationship between frequency and wavelength? Yes, there is. Please tell us. Uh, the relationship between frequency and wavelength is inversely proportional. Love it. So they are opposite to each other. Love it. I, I love the scientific words that she's utilizing as well. So I really appreciate that. Um, so spot on, right? Um, just maybe going back to this diagram, you can actually see it. Um, at the very, on the left-hand side, you see that the waves have a very, very um, short, um, uh, sorry, a, a longer wavelength, okay? And because of the longer wavelength, the frequency of it is quite smaller. And as you get more to the uh, right-hand side, you have shorter wavelengths or with higher frequency, okay? Um, now, if you all think back to the example of the, um, the ocean and the waves sort of coming uh, against um, and crashing against the shore, okay? Um, if you bear in mind that waves carry energy, okay? And that's very, very important to remember it. Um, and at the very, very bottom end of the, of the spectrum, we have the waves that carry the least amount of energy. But as we get more to the um, higher frequency type levels, they start to increase energy. Okay, you'll, you'll learn later why that is ultimately important. Um, but as I'm flipping through, again, anyone's just welcome to jump in and tell us why that is the case uh, and, and what the impact of that is. Uh, Colin, sorry if I may. Yes, Nico. Uh, just as a matter of interest, um, also the what you discussed now, the uh, wavelengths that get uh, shorter, is if you look at antenna technology. So the higher the frequency, the smaller the antenna or the length of the antenna. Well, well, that's a fantastic uh, point as well, Nico. Thanks for that. Um, yes, particularly in terms of, um, you know, designing communication systems, okay? Um, the antenna that Nico is talking about is basically the point at which the wave goes from electrical um, sort of energy into sort of the electromagnetic type energy. Um, and the antenna determines, uh, it's typically designed against the frequency that, that it's basically transmitting. And, and therefore, there is an impact on the size of the antenna, etc. So that's a great point, thank you. Um, so we say that the wavelengths are getting smaller and the frequencies are getting higher and there is an inverse relationship between the, um, the wavelength and uh, the frequency ultimately, okay? Um, so just a quick recap on that, high frequency, we're gonna carry a lot more energy, okay? Um, and here's an interesting point, um, EM waves, do not require media in which to travel or move. Would anybody like to just sort of comment on that and tell us what that means? That means that uh, electromagnetic waves can transfer through a vacuum, as in the case of the sun, 
and the Earth, the sun emits a whole range of electromagnetic waves, everything from um, X-rays to, to uh, UV rays, to my knowledge. And this can transfer through the vacuum of space. I, actually, to my knowledge, just an interesting uh, tidbit I'd like to add. Yes. I remember hearing that in uh, way back when they actually hypothesized of something called the ether because they originally thought that absolutely nothing could travel without a medium or in other words, in a vacuum. So they mm -hmm. thought that space was filled with this um, almost invisible, invisible particle they named the ether. This was only disproven when they were able to transfer heat through a vacuum. Thank you. Thanks for sharing that, uh, Declan. That's, that's actually quite interesting. Um, look, and, 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 and going back to EM waves not requiring a media, because if you think about it, and like you pointed out, a lot of the UV uh, that we get from the sun is traveling. Remember, in space, there's a nothingness, um, ultimately, right? Um, and if if it were not able to travel through through vacuums, sure, there would be a lot less activity happening here on Earth. Um, so, so fortunately, we're able to transmit EM waves also outward. Um, if you think about communications, right? Um, when we have um, rocket ships that go up into space, we have the ability to communicate with them. Um, so, if you think about our future at some point where we become an, um, a multi-planet species. Right, we'll have the ability to communicate wherever we might be, um, you know, from one point to the other. Um, but yeah, so there's an interesting point that I'll, that I'll sort of cover ultimately later. Um, EM waves are also considered to be transverse waves, okay, because the disturbance happen, happens in this direction and perpendicular to it is the propagation ultimately, okay. Um, So, so infrared waves, um, you'll find the yeah, typically has a much shorter sort of wavelength, but typically we relate this to, to heat. Um, you'll find that the military makes use of it, uh, you know, they call it um, night vision um, that, that, that basically is enabled. They have these specific types of goggles that have the ability to see infrared. Uh, I've demonstrated earlier on how you're able to see infrared. So they use that to basically pick up um, heat signatures uh, of people and, and, and um, animals, uh, potentially, that uh, tend to move in the dark. And we also use it to encode information to help us control remote control devices, etc. Um, visible light is an interesting area as well, right? So from a connectivity perspective, um, you'll find that we make use of it to, in fact, a lot of you right now are currently utilizing this particular device. Any ideas what I might be referring to? Anybody would like to take a stab at where is visible light used in communications? Well, I should say, um, it, 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 let's call it the light spectrum. That, 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 that was a bit clue. Uh, okay. Yeah, Tafara. On they used in like uh, high speed communications, like Wi Fi or something like that. I'm not quite sure. Um, so the first part, yeah, it, uh, it, it is actually used more for high speed communications. This is not, it's not Wi Fi. Uh, well, I think a, a visible light is used in lamps and uh, because, okay, also in photosynthesis because it stimulates latina. Um, you're correct that uh, yeah, look, light is also required from a, a photosynthesis perspective. Um, uh, Judy, you've got your hand up. Yes, Colin, maybe it's just uh, very old fashioned of me, but you know, for me, uh, uh, a, a movie or a photo, uh, you know, a movie um, where you're using light for communication, 
um, you know, and uh, yeah, I mean, also, if, uh, you know, back to the point of, you know, that's, that's driven by a bulb, you know, um, where we're actually using the, we, we're using the light uh, and the different colors to, to convey images. And it's those images that actually um, are a means of communication. So I'm sorry, there's like a really old fashioned analog uh, wow, yeah, approach I, to have to it. Yeah. That fantastic, Judy. In fact, I, I didn't think about that, but you are absolutely spot on. In fact, you also reminded me that um, just like how you've got Wi Fi, um, right? So remember, Wi Fi is uh, the electromagnetic spectrum and it's, it's an area that we cannot see, it's a radio wave ultimately. You can now, they've invented a technology to use, excuse me, Li-Fi, okay? So basically uh, it, it utilizes your light. So one thing that most people have uh, wherever they're working is a light uh, right above them. Um, so they've, they've actually now have an ability to basically communicate using uh, lights uh, and, and terminating that on, on your computer. Uh, Judy? I'm so sorry, I must lower my hand. Okay, no, no issues. Um, look, the other area that we actually make use of, of light um, is this little device, okay? Lasers. Um, and and um, where are lasers used from a connectivity perspective? Um, someone's got their hand up. I can't quite see. Is it Megan? Megan, you put your hand up. Yes. Um, well, to your to answer your previous question, actually, could um, I see Brittany and I had the same idea? We were thinking the LED screens that we have on our own devices. I will give you points for that. Absolutely agree. And uh, then to answer, sorry, here I'll continue. No, no, please, please go for it. Um, for lasers, what about like x-rays that you do at the hospital? I'm not sure if that's right. So, so x-rays, you, you, we do make use of it, but uh, remember x-rays we cannot see. Um, interesting enough, just thinking about that, we actually use x-rays to see, but we, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll kind of cover it, but you can't really see uh, an, an x-ray itself. But uh, uh, the dashboard's lighting up with hands. I think Declan was next and then uh, followed by Berori. Um, fiber optics use um, the, the lasers to transmit data because with fiber optics, you're able to guide the direction in which light moves. So you're able to send extremely short and fast pulses, transferring data between points and, well, the speed of light. Fantastic, right? It's fiber optics. And, and, and we know that a lot of us use fiber optics for connectivity. Uh, Birori, did you have something to say as well? Yeah, I wanted to talk about fiber optics, which uses also the laser to transmit data while they are carrying out total internal reflection inside the, the cable. Excellent. Love it. All right. That, that is absolutely spot on. I'm going to leave you with sort of, um, you know, we'll have 10 minutes um, remaining. Uh, I'm going to maybe spend another two more minutes just to sort of close up on the on the connectivity side and we'll sort of have a very quick break. But very quickly, uh, here's an interesting point. The word laser is not just a word uh, that sort of came about. It actually stands for something, right? Um, it, it stands for light amplification of stimulated emission of radiation. All right, so in, in your spare time, please go ahead and, and uh, you know, find out exactly what each of those words mean and exactly how um, lasers actually work from, uh, from that perspective. So there's some other bits of information here that you can sort of uh, cover in, in your time, but you know, around very quickly from an um, X-ray perspective, um, you know, these are very, very specific um, wavelengths that are quite, quite, quite tiny. Uh, and they have the ability to now penetrate into tissue. Um, and as we can see here, on the left hand side, we've got, uh, I think that looks like somebody's teeth. Okay. And on the right hand side, that kind of looks like somebody's 
um, pelvic area, uh, I suppose, and you can see their, uh, their spine at the back end as well. But interestingly, with from an x-ray perspective, we can't really see the ray itself, um, but yeah, ironically, we use it to see uh, other things ultimately. Um, and then, of course, you know, um, somebody mentioned this on uh, quite earlier on, uh, you know, gamma rays, uh, you know, we spoke about the fact that as you get to the very, very high frequency range of the spectrum, and because of that, of that it carries a, uh, you know, quite a bit of, uh, uh, quite a lot of energy, ultimately. And we, and we sort of harness that energy to help us treat cancer, by way of example, okay? So we use gamma rays that can specifically target tissue within our bodies and start to destroy um, those tissues. And it, it, it's that the destruction of tissue is ultimately us harnessing its, its energy um, from that standpoint. Um, okay, cool. I think uh, before we sort of hop into um, uh, radio waves, et cetera, after the break, we'll take a question from Ruby, Ruby uh, very quickly, Ruby. Uh, no, it's not actually a question, but it's about what you said about the um, x-rays, and that's just because of the, um, I don't know if it's the size of the wavelength, I think it is, because um, like visible light can be blocked by literally almost anything. Ultraviolet light can, some of it can be blocked by the clouds. And then x-rays, it can go through our body, but it can't go through the bones. And that's why we see the reflection of the light because we see um, the bones in the picture because that's where it's reflecting off and it's bouncing back. And then the gamma rays, I think it passes through us and it has to go through like a very, very large amount of concrete. And that's what they use with um, nuclear power stations. They have a lot of concrete on the outside of the power plants to prevent any like leakage. Is that correct? Fantastic. Absolutely fantastic. Okay. <laughs> spot on, right? So we have to find ways of containing the, the energies that a lot of these, um, these things are ultimately e emit. Um, yeah, you know, so, so visible light has a problem with getting through or transmitting through um, certain media. Um, we know that light can go through glass, uh, for example, but it can't travel through a brick wall. Um, and we, we require a higher energy um, type ray or, or, or higher frequency to, to ultimately penetrate walls, uh, etc. So I think, you know, with that said, um, uh, perhaps we will stop here, um, you know, for a very, very quick bio break, coffee break, um, you know, go ahead and uh, take a walk around, get some vitamin D outside and um, yeah, Judy, are you happy if we sort of kick off again around 10 past 12? Colin, that's absolutely amazing. Uh, let me pause quickly. Where we, we go. Great. Um, so I think, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll sort of kick off from radio waves, uh, you know, so specifically. And we see that th there are so many different applications um, of radio waves. Um, and you'll find that there are different types of radio waves, right? So we, we have ones that have long wavelengths um, with uh, low frequencies, and then it goes all the way up through to, um, you know, sort of very high frequencies uh, and, and sort of low wave wavelengths as well. And, you know, just here are just some examples in terms of what we make use of uh, radio waves for. Um, satellite communications, right, on the left-hand side, um, um, you know, so a lot of you might be asking, hmm, that doesn't quite look like a satellite, right? It's a little dish on the earth looking up uh, at the sky. Uh, but essentially these are ground stations and they are indeed required uh, to communicate back up to, to satellites. And we'll, we'll sort of cover that just now in terms of how they are able to, to communicate. The other little uh, retro looking device in the middle there is a, is a radio. Uh, you know, so for those of you that listen to uh, to radio, um, I I'll be very keen to run a poll at some point. Um, you know, so from a radio standpoint, we know that there's an FM band and an AM band. Um, we'll cover the differences uh, in, in those two just now. I'll be very keen to, to hear if anyone listens to AM radio, um, or I wonder if it's just, just a very, very specific set of people. Um, and actually, you're welcome to comment in the chat as well. You know, just pop down if anybody listens to AM uh, and, and what is it that you're listening to. Um, 
And then the other bit, a uh, little picture on the right hand side is the microwaves. Um, you know, so here again, uh, we make use of radio waves, uh, you know, so we call it a microwave. Uh, it's a very, very short wavelength, meaning if it's a low wavelength, it's got to be a very high frequency. And high frequency means lots and lots of energy, right? Uh, and we know that utilizing the energy from microwaves, we have the ability to, to cook and to, to warm, warm up our food, etc. Um, now, I'm not sure if, if any of you remember good old Encyclopedia Britannica. And, uh, you know, there are very, very specific people on this call, maybe maybe around about three or four of us, uh, you know, but we, we um, yeah, we used to used to get a lot of these um, these door to door salespeople uh, trying to sell uh, sell you these this entire stack of of encyclopedias at the time. But uh, I thought yeah, it'll be quite fun to put this old retro type picture up here in terms of various other um, spaces where we, we utilize our, um, radio waves. Um, you know, we use it for for maritime uh, navigation. Uh, we use it for maritime signaling. Um, we, we use it for, uh, of course, uh, radios as well. Uh, so you'll find that specifically we use AM radio when it comes to maritime radio. And I'm going to show you why just now, why specifically AM radio. Um, then there's shortwave radio. And I, I know that there are specific applications there about around uh, weather um, and telemetry type um, data that's transmitted through, through shortwave. Um, and then, of course, we go on to television, FM radio, um, finally, up towards space and satellite communications. Um, and then, of course, radio astronomy. This is such an amazing area uh, or a great application for those of you um, that, uh, that don't know. But we have the ability uh, to currently look at the, the night sky through, uh, through a telescope. And essentially, a normal telescope is based on optics, right? You look through the one end. And all the bits of light coming into the other, you're able to see um, planets, you're able to see some stars, uh, etc. But when, when we want to see a lot further, okay, we would like to make use of very, very, very high frequencies, and we want to be able to sort of capture that. Um, and again, we make use of radio, um, radio antenna and radio signaling to basically see further into, into space. Um, you know, close to the Western Cape uh, is uh, something called the SKA. Uh, it's the Square Kilometer Array, which is basically um, a mesh of or a network of these types of little antennas that use radio waves to essentially see, um, you know, into the deep, dark um, areas of, of space. Um, just the, the, um, the little blocks at the bottom that talk about VLF, LF, HF, VHF, UHF. I think a lot of you might be familiar. You, you probably would have seen VHF and UHF um, if you've got DSTV and, and that type of thing. But essentially, um, these are, again, different names uh, that we use for multiples of, uh, of frequencies. So VLF is very low frequency. LF is low frequency, then medium frequency, then high, then very high, then ultra high, et cetera, et cetera. Right, so the, the, these names actually relate to uh, a multiple of, of the frequencies that we're looking at. And then you find at the bottom, to give you an idea typically of, of the, the range um, of frequencies that, um, that operate uh, in this particular area, uh, we see it runs from anything from three kilohertz, uh, which is 3000 hertz, up to around about 300 gigahertz. Um, you know, which is essentially 300 million million or 300,000 gigahertz, uh, essentially. So, um, you know, so, so we know that uh, utilizing radio waves, we have the ability to, uh, to, to transmit data, right? Um, apart from a, from, from a radio perspective, we have the ability to transmit audio. And that's really what we were setting through the airwaves. Um, but we also have the ability to utilize the same um, sort of radio waves to transmit data. Um, I don't know if any of you have these newer cars um, with these radios on it. And when you basically 
as you're driving along and say you're listening to you know one of our local stations here is kfm and you listen to kfm um, and you see that it's actually just playing the name of the artist it's just playing the name um, of the song that they're singing and it tells you a little bit about the radio station as well and it might even tell you who the current presenter is and we know it changes over time because when the next song plays that information changes as well um, so that is utilizing a system called RDS or radio data system, right? And, and what they're doing is from the radio station, in addition to transmitting the, the audio, they're also encoding the data um, within, a, within a particular frequency that these radios then decode, okay? So that process of taking information and putting it onto a certain frequency it's called modulation, right? So we take um, the artist name, the artist, the radio station name, the presenter name, uh, the song name, you know, all those bits and bits of data. We then modulate it, uh, you know, as, as represented by the, um, the blue wave here. We then place that on top of a very, very specific frequency. And that frequency is called a carrier wave, okay? Um, so for example, I think KFM, uh, you'd need to tune into, I think, 104.0 um, um, megahertz, right? And that 104.0 megahertz is the specific frequency that that carrier wave is running at, right? So, um, and, and that's how we're able to, to switch between the multiple different channels. We're utilizing multiple different carrier waves that are tuned to a particular frequency. And that carrier wave is carrying sort of a payload, right? You can think of the modulated information as, uh, as cargo that the carrier wave is sort of transporting to your radio, ultimately. So it modulates it onto a carrier, right? And that process is called modulation. And when it gets onto your car, um, it, your, your, your car system and electronics then demodulate it, right? So, so modulation is adding information onto a carrier and demodulation is extracting the data um, from the specific carrier, right? And then of course your car radio can then display uh, the data and you're able to listen to, to the music coming out of your, your stereo, okay? Um, some of you, um, uh, probably not many of you, again, um, back in the old day when the uh, internet was connected using telephones, right? Connectivity happened through uh, your telephones, which is which is audio, um, and and we had these devices that you had to connect to your your telephones called a modem, okay. And the word modem comes from exactly this. The M O stands for modulation, and the D E M stands for demodulation, right? So therefore, they put the two words together and they say, well, that device is called a modem because it helps you put information through your telephone and um, extract um, information from your telephone itself. Um, now, the bottom two waves here represent the difference between um, AM and FM. I think I asked earlier on who of you actually listen to um, AM radio stations okay, and, and FM radio stations. Um, you'll find that um, 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 AM um, basically means amplitude modulation. And what it does here, it basically takes your carrier waves and it changes the carrier wave based on the amplitude of the modulator, right? So if you look, if you look in enough, um, um, you'll find just that amplitude basically refers to the size of the wave, okay? Just, just for simplistic um, um, uh, purposes, it's essentially the size of the wave. So you'll see the size of the amplitude modulated wave is varying quite a bit, okay? Um, and, and that basically is carrying the data but varying the amplitude. Now, when it gets to the other side, the receiving system knows what the carrier wave is supposed to look like, and it does, does a difference, right? It basically is, what is the difference between that carrier wave and the amplitude modulated wave? And it then is able to extract the modulated, uh, the information from it, okay? Whereas you'll find frequency modulation at the bottom does the same thing. It basically modulates the carrier wave, but based on frequency, and which is why you can find Although the amplitude is exactly the same, but the frequency of it is varying. And, and, and you can see the differences in frequencies. It's like a slinky being stretched and a slinky being sort of um, compressed, et cetera. Okay. Um, now, 
what is the purpose of having these two types of, um, of signals? We go back to our good old friend, the ionosphere, okay? Um, so I wonder if you recall um, the conversation with my other colleague, uh, Melina, who did um, some aspects of, um, of the earth and the atmosphere, and she spoke about a very specific layer called the ionosphere. So when, when we sort of communicate from, from one side to the other side, um, I, I also would like to know if, if there are any, any one of us on the call that sort of believes the earth is flat, right? If you believe the earth is flat, please just, you know, pop in, pop in a comment into, into the chat and, 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 and yeah, you know, we're not going to judge anybody, but, but, you know, for, for those of you that believe that the, the earth is round, um, you know, we know that there's going to come a point where if you have two people standing on, on a ground, so for example, if you have two people standing one meter apart, they'll be literally uh, in line of sight, right? That's essentially the term that we make use of. If they move about a couple of meters further, they might still be able to see each other. But as they continue to walk backward, right, there's going to come a point um, at which they are not going to be able to see each other, okay? And, and, and that's basically based on the curvature of the Earth. <clears throat> so a lot of communication systems um, make use of the fact that there is line of sight between two transmitting um, devices. But once you now sort of move to further ends of the Earth um, and the curvature starts to kick in, these two devices are unable to see each other, okay? Um, so looking at the, um, the bottom left-hand side, there's a little triangle at the bottom and that's, that's essentially a transmitter. Now, when the transmitter starts to transmit signals, uh, you'll find typically some signals depending on their on their wavelength uh, and frequencies actually penetrate. They go right through the ionosphere quite quite easily, right? And this is typically things like um, FM. FM actually goes goes right through because it's got a higher um, a higher frequency, okay, and a a shorter wavelength. But um, so that's basically A and B. But if you look at C. Okay, C is very, um, is indicative of AM or, or uh, amplitude modulation. And essentially what happens here, um, AM typically makes use of very short wavelengths, right? Um, and, and because of the, the nature of the um, ionosphere, it has the ability to bounce radio waves back onto the earth um, as well. So what eventually happens is that you've got a transmitter transmitting an, uh, a shortwave signal, which is then bounced off the ionosphere and it hits a point on the Earth where it says first bounce. And the Earth also has the ability to then bounce back uh, that signal, which then hits the ionosphere again. And you find that this bouncing um, uh, ability suddenly makes it possible for a tower on the one side of the Earth to communicate to a tower on the other, other side of the Earth. So, as you can imagine, um, ham radio uh, enthusiasts were, were absolutely blown away with this phenomenon and that they were now able to communicate over long ranges. Uh, and you'll find that there's also an application into sort of ships at sea, uh, you know, utilizing this phenomenon to, to communicate uh, to the other side. Um, so yeah, which is why I think the ionosphere is really a good friend of ours, particularly from an AM um, you know, enthusiast perspective, or if you're into hand radio. Um, very quickly, in terms of, uh, you know, some of the various different principles uh, around waves, you've already, looking at the, uh, at the information on the top uh, left-hand side, uh, the amplitude of a wave is basically the distance from rest up to the uh, a peak, okay? That's the, the size of the wave or the amplitude. Um, the other word uh, that you should know is wavelength, right? So wavelength is basically the distance from one point um, of the curve to another point uh, on the curve, which is sort of in phase of the first point. So for example, you could measure um, the distance between one peak to the other peak or the distance from one trough to the other trough. And that will give you your wavelength in meters. And that is represented by the Greek letter lambda, okay? 
Um, another term that you'll come across is uh, T or the period, right? So basically, um, the, the period of the wave is how much of, the, um, of how long does it take for a cycle um, of, of the wave to propagate in one second, okay? Um, then uh, looking at the, um, the next graph, we've got um, what does a high frequency wave look compared to a low frequency wave? Um, so a high frequency wave, you can start to see more of the waves sort of being crammed uh, into, into a particular time uh, frame. Whereas a low frequency wave, you see less of the wave propagating in that same amount of time. Okay. Um, relating sort of amplitude to loud and quiet. Okay. So um, if, you, if you use the volume on your phone or if you use the volume on a stereo, uh, when you sort of turn it down, you're basically reducing the amplitude of that wave. It's a lower amplitude type wave. When you start to dial up uh, the volume, the, um, the sound is a lot louder. Um, for those of you that are musicians um, on the call, uh, you would probably use a term called pitch, okay? So where you find that there is a low frequency, uh, maybe you're playing uh, a bass instrument typically, right? Which has a far lower pitch. That's what the wave from ulti ultimately looks like. You'll see it's got a longer wavelength. Um, and you know, for those of you sort of playing the trumpet to the flute, um, they tend to have a higher pitch because it's a higher frequency, right? So that's sort of relating, relating those elements. And then of course, um, you know, I promised you some equations as well. The top equation V is equal to lambda times frequency. So V relates to the speed of the wave. Uh, lambda refers to the, uh, so, so speed of the wave is in meters, uh, meters per second. Lambda is represented in meters. And F um, relates to, to frequency, okay? Uh, and then two other um, equations that you should be familiar with. Uh, in fact, there's one or two questions in the assignment at the end. Uh, T or the period of a wave is equal to one over frequency. And of course, the inverse of that F is equal to one over T. Okay, so just some very, very quick uh, equations that you might need to respond to the questions later on. Um, so moving into, into connectivity, uh, et cetera. Now we know that the internet, there are various different ways for us to, to communicate across it. Um, you know, what I see represented here are mostly wireless uh, type options. So things like um, Bluetooth, um, RFID, uh, Wi-Fi, satellite con connectivity, et cetera, all, all examples of wireless uh, type um, communications. But there's also wired um, types of connectivity options available. So you've got things like an Ethernet cable. Uh, you've got an options like, uh, like a fiber optic cable. Um, you've also, there are still places in the world today that still make use of telephone lines, right? Or we used to call them copper cables um, to, to communicate, et cetera. So various different options that we have available for us to sort of communicate to, to the internet. And of course, we run a whole range of different applications uh, utilizing those different types of connectivity options. So essentially, um, I'm not too sure if some of you are aware, but you know, if you hop onto a flight, uh, you still have the ability to, to access the internet, right? And you'll find that they make use of Wi-Fi within the plane itself uh, to connect all the different uh, devices. And then up on the plane, uh, on, on sort of the top at some point, they've got a little um, terminal that communicates to, to satellite. Okay, so they've got two little um, types of connectivity providing you with internet uh, options. Um, an interesting, another interesting example here is that um, you find typically within buildings, because buildings are uh, more manageable, they're on the ground, uh, you're able to control, uh, you know, what happens within that building, and it's not a too much of a dynamic environment. So we typically run fiber optics uh, throughout an entire building, uh, which provides, um, you know, high speed type connectivity, etc. Whereas um, when you're at home, you don't want to be connected by cable uh, into anything. So we want to make use of, of a wireless technology. 
then you'll find um, in the new age of cars, um, you know, cars are now communicating up into the internet, uh, sharing telemetry information, there's entertainment information, et cetera. Um, and cars have a whole range of different connectivity options, right? So they make use of mostly um, GSM or mobile connectivity, right? So your, um, your typical sort of cell phone type uh, providers. Um, but, in, but in addition to that, they may have, for example, a GPS uh, receiver to provide information about its location. In addition to that, uh, they also have FM radios, right? So there's FM radio uh, connectivity as well. So I think, you know, the point of this particular slide is to say that depending, um, you know, the, the, the common, commonly used um, sort of phrase for that is um, horses for courses, right? So depending on the course that you have, you might require a different type of horse. Um, and the same thing applies here where, depending on the different use case that you have in mind, there are different ways of uh, providing connectivity. Um, you later learn that, you know, each type of connectivity has a range of pros and cons, right? There are cost impacts uh, to certain types of, of connectivity options. There are um, speed uh, limitations. There are, um, you know, impact, um, uh, impact by the surrounding environment, uh, by way of example, right? So there's quite a few different factors that also help you determine what is the right uh, connectivity option that you could potentially use. So very quickly on the on the internet, um, you know, uh, I want to sort of give you a very, very high level um, play in terms of what this is really all about. So in the middle, in your purple sort of area, the internet is connected by a whole bunch of little devices called routers, okay? And all that routers are is that you can think of them as post offices, right? They receive an email coming in or they receive a package from one point. They look at it and they look at the destination address and then pass it along to the next router, which helps it to be delivered um, to the correct place that it needs to be delivered, right? So ultimately, the internet is really just a connection of all these multiple different um, routers that pass along packages. They pick up a, a box from one, one area and transmit it in the least amount of time to the next uh, possible destination. Uh, Tafara, so I, I saw your green box light up. Is that is there something you wanted to add? Uh, I don't think it's me. Okay, no, that's fine. So in the middle, no, sorry, got... sorry, Colin. Yeah, yes. I, it's just uh, maybe it was. I'm just I'm just posting things in the chat as you're talking. Oh, okay, so okay. I don't know. Maybe something went up. Great. No, no, sorry no, about that. No issues whatsoever. So we, the internet is really just, as I said, a massive, massive, think of it, a, a postal network, right? Connected by multiple different post offices, uh, post offices. And they're pure, the only work they're supposed to do is receive a package and deliver a package based on its source and its destination information, okay? Now, so you find at the bottom right-hand side, I don't know what color that is, uh, it looks like a salmon, a salmon-y type of color. But, um, you know, so all your applications, right? Things like cloud services. An example of a cloud service is Kibana, right? So your Kibana dashboards, et cetera, sort of lives in that environment where you have things like uh, a web server, right? And the actual application is running in that environment and it connects into the middle, into the bubble area, which is the actual backbone of the internet, okay? Now, um, the other thing I wanted to also point out is um, you know, when you use things like www.kibana.com or you go to www.intelsat.com or www.maxiq.space, I think, uh, is, is this what the correct one is, uh, or www.google.com, those names, right? Um, so remember that every device on the internet um, actually natively is given a number. Okay, and that number is called an IP address. Uh, an example of an IP address is 196.25.1.1, um, or you know, a server belonging to Google I know is 8.8.8.8, which is a very cool, cool number to remember. Um, and then typically you'll find your, your kit and your devices uh, would have a number like 10.0.0.4.5, 
or a, a 10.1.4.1, you know, by way of example. So those are IP addresses. Now, because we are humans, uh, it's, it's practically impossible for us to remember all of these different numbers across the internet. So what we would, what, what works out easier for us is for us to remember a name, right? It's a lot easier to remember www.intelsat.com. Um, you know, and, and a lot easier to remember www.google.com, a boy of example. So the bottom blue box where it says DNS or domain name system helps us map the name to the number of the computer itself. Okay. Now, without that, that DNS uh, system, a lot of the internet will stop working, right? Because when you hop onto www.instagram.com or you go to facebook.com, um, that you won't be able to connect to the sites if the DNS system is currently offline, right? So the DNS is a very, very key aspect of, of the internet. Um, and then finally, so we've got on the one side all these different services and web pages that are being placed onto the internet, right? But we need to get those connected to you, um, ultimately, wherever you might be. On the other side there, on the top left-hand side, we have the green box, which is essentially um your internet service provider okay so your internet service provider could be um uh, an mweb or it could be um a verizon or it could be an at and or um it could be an optotal or um access or you know whatever whatever that might be um they basically ensure that they connect your home into the backbone of the internet and the way they connect your home into the backbone of the internet is again, a whole range of different ways. They could connect a cable uh, into your home. They could connect a fiber link. They could connect you via a radio link in, in a lot of cases actually, okay? Um, so, so that's why you have a whole range of different options of how to get you into the, into the internet. Um, very key aspect, just looking at this entire sort of um, plane of the internet or the internet infrastructure, all of the arrows that you're seeing utilize some or the other type of connectivity option. So it's very important to note that in some of these cases, uh, you have terrestrial communications happening. So uh, a microwave link uh, is an example, or you might even have a fiber link from one router to the other router. But there are instances where um, you, know, you need to communicate across the world. Um, and, and then of course you, we have now, um, well, back in the days, it used to be satellite communication. So for anything that is longer distance, we would make use of, uh, of satellite um, connectivity. But you'll start to find, you might've heard of companies like Main One, and you would have heard of WEX, and you would have heard of Seacom. Uh, you know, so these are undersea cables, right? So they literally are running cables under the, on the seabed um, to connect from one side to the other side. We've got cables that run from Africa through to South America. Uh, we've got cables that run from Africa to uh, China, to Australia, uh, to Europe. Um, so there's a lot more connectivity options available today, and which is why the quality and, and the speed of, of connectivity has, has drastically improved. Okay. So, so this is sort of a very quick overview of, of what the internet is all about. Um, and here we can see that there are many, many different uh, use cases. Uh, you know, we see aeroplanes as well. They have the ability to make um, use of satellite connectivity, um, emergency and safety uh, operations, make use of it, et cetera. But a very key point that we need to always remember is that you cannot expect to find the same type of connectivity in a typically urban area when you compare that to a rural or a remote and isolated area, right? So the options, of connectivity are best in an urban area. So, which is why, for those of you that are living close to, to the city, um, you know, you've got multiple options and your, your speed of connectivity is a lot quicker. When you look at farmers, for example, right, they really struggle with connectivity, et cetera, because the only options that they would have there is a satellite. And I think there, you can very, very quick, quickly pick up that satellite connectivity back in the old days was, was a bit of an issue because it uh, was fairly slow. Um, and it also was affected by something called latency, right? So by the time a packet takes to get from one side to the other side, uh, so a router to a router, it would typically take around about four to 600 milliseconds. Um, you think, you know, just, just to compare that, when you're sitting at your school and you're connected into your local network, 
um, for you to communicate to the person next to you typically takes about one to two milliseconds, right? So that, that sort of communication link is a lot quicker uh, as opposed to SATA, which is now 400 to 600 milliseconds. Um, um, in terms of sort of your, um, your affordable and clean energy SDG 7, you'll find, uh, I mentioned to you that each type of connectivity options um, have different um, um, sort of um, uh, metrics or they have, uh, you know, different types of influences, et cetera. So what, what you see up here are various different types of uh, wireless technologies, right? So um, right now, um, you know, you, you'll find that 5G is an emerging sort of uh, technology. You'll find Wi-Fi is something that you make use of uh, already. Uh, and then things like NBIoT are so, also um, currently available. So if you recall, uh, for those of you carrying out experiments in your power um, sort of assignments, one of the questions was around the battery life. Is that we want to test how long can these devices sort of stay connected, et cetera. Okay. And the clue to it all is actually on this on the slide. If you look at Wi-Fi connectivity and its power consumption, okay. So um, typically Wi-Fi is around about low to medium. Um, I would actually correct that to be sort of more medium to high. Um, you know, so it, it does require quite a bit of, of um of power capabilities. So when you compare that to something like um, LTE or NB-IoT, for example, right, you'll find that battery life is directly impacted. Well, what, what it simply means is that if I have your kit utilizing Wi-Fi and I connect it with a battery uh, and I get it to communi start communicating over time, it might, it might die out after two to three days of operation. But if I take um, the same kit, but I run it using an NBIoT um, sort of link to communicate with the internet, um, I might be able to run it for at least one to two years, okay? So immediately you can start to see the impact of battery life and, and how important that becomes. You know, think about these devices up in space or in remote locations or on Mars for that matter, right? So there's a very, very um, direct link between power consumption and the type of connectivity that we actually make use of. Okay, so very, we need to sort of be aware of that. Um, and I think over you know, the last couple of minutes remaining, uh, I'll touch a little bit about satellite communications. Um, so how do, we, how do we communicate from one side of the earth to the other side of the earth? We basically make use of the satellite to relay um, signal from the transmitting antenna through to the receiving uh, antenna. And also vice versa, right? So we do have the ability to, to do that. So ultimately satellites, so you can think of them as giant mirrors up in, up in the sky that basically reflect uh, a lot of these signals back, back to Earth, right? So that's how we utilize um, those particular um, um, uh, connectivity type medium. Now, off late, a lot of you may have heard of Starlink. And, and I don't know if um, I've seen this looking up into, space, into the night sky. The top left hand side, you see there's a trail of, of sort of white dots flying across the sky. Okay. Those are actually uh, Starlink. Yes. Isn't that what's going to basically replace like the C type of uh, connection where you were mentioning that there is going to be, there was or there is some type of connection between Africa to China where that won't be the primary use of connection where this Starlink project will be replacing that because from what I've seen, it is a better and faster alternative to the C-type connection, if that makes sense. So, so, so not quite, uh, Tafara. So essentially what um, Starlink aims to solve is going back to this slide here, right? If you see on the urban side, there are tons and tons of, of connectivity options available. We're also able to reach very, very high speeds. We're also able to reach it at very, very low latency, latencies, right? Whereas the rural and the remote sides uh, typically struggle uh, with connectivity. What Starlink is aiming to do is to solve the problem for the rural to the remote areas and provide them with very, very high speed connectivity options and very yes. low latency options as well. Yes. Okay. Um, Declan. 
Hello, yes, I just wanted to mention that Starlink definitely, absolutely is not trying to outplay systems like um, fiber connecting our homes. Reason being is number one, the latency is 33 milliseconds, which is fairly high. And the speed is capped to my knowledge at 107 megabits per second, or megabytes. Can't mind remember i imagine it's bytes you know, sure. megabytes per second megabit yeah yeah, it's, it's yeah but it is it is capped so with fiber we can reach way faster speeds is what i'm trying to say oh yeah that's for urban right. settings it's probably not going to be the best starlink correct and, and, and so you spot on that Declan. so when compared to fiber connectivity fiber definitely out, outweighs it right but relatively speaking, um, comparing a Starlink uh, to uh, your traditional type of satellite type connectivity, the traditional satellite uh, latency is around four to 600 milliseconds. And as you pointed out, a Starlink latency is actually 20 to 30 milliseconds. So relatively, it's better um, in, in a remote sort of environment. And also speeds, uh, you know, going up to like 100 megabits per second in a rural area. Whereas currently, you know, they operate between two to five megabits per second, right? So, so, so ultimately, Starlink was was actually designed for that. But um, the main reason that Starlink exists is to provide um, um, is to provide interplanetary communications. Okay, so we, we I believe that Starlink is currently building this around Earth currently to to test a system. But they're going to go and deploy around Mars. All right. So imagine providing these types of connectivity options around Mars, and then you sort of link the two networks together through some high-speed laser, okay, uh, from Mars to, to the Earth sort of Starlink mesh. And all of a sudden, we now can communicate with uh, our friends that would have traveled through to, to Mars. Okay. So it, it brings about a whole new range of different um, um, capabilities there. So I guess, you know, with just a few minutes left, um, you know, we're kind of at the end of the, of the conversation. Um, you know, I want you to think about here, and, and maybe we won't discuss it right now, is I'd like you to think about what are the various different RF um, devices that you have on your kit? Um, you know, so if, if you can think about that and sort of pop that onto uh, the Canvas platform and you know, let's have a conversation about that. Um, and also, for each of the different RF transmitters on the kit, what do you think is the impact on power, right? And, and you, would have, um, you would have gotten those answers from the first assignment uh, already. So you should be able to have a direct correlation there. Um, you know, so here again on the Mars habitat, et cetera, you know, we spoke a little bit about uh, the, the Starlink potentially being deployed there, et cetera. But again, share, share your ideas uh, on the Canvas platform itself. Um, and then, of course, with the assignment, we are going to put this up um, onto the, um, the Canvas platform, you know, so I'm, I'm very interested to see what distances, you know, firstly, how would you measure, um, you know, the furthest distance possible that you could be from your Wi-Fi access point, right? It'll be very inter interesting to see uh, the various responses from, from, from all of you. Uh, and another sort of um, sneaky question I threw in there as well is around, how do different types of materials affect your signal? Like if you if you had your your max IQ kit and you placed a bowl over it, right? Uh, maybe a steel bowl uh, versus a ceramic bowl versus a plastic bowl versus a cardboard box, um, or some of you want to sort of build a little brick housing around that. You know, go ahead and do do that. But try different materials. And see how it impacts on your on your Wi-Fi signal as well. So, um, you know, a couple of things that you can actually trial out in, in that particular assignment. Um, and then, of course, to test your theory, right? Which is what we're here for ultimately. Is that we've got a whole bunch of questions which we'll uh, upload onto onto the assignment itself. Um, so I think, um, yeah, with that, uh, Judy, I'd like to hand back to you. Colin, fantastic. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, that's a really interesting experiment that you outlined there of um, looking at different materials and different distances, et cetera. Um, 
for, for those of you who um, are connected to the Kibana dashboard, um, what I'd like to do is let me actually just simply, um, let me show you uh, how you do that um, on, on Kibana, how, what you could do in terms of running that experiment. So uh, I'm just quickly gonna share my screen. Um, so um, there, are, there have been some people who've had a few challenges um, when it comes to the Kibana dashboard. Um, it only really works properly if you're accessing it from a, a computer, a laptop, or maybe even a tablet. Um, you can... Julie, it sounds like you dropped your microphone, but we cannot hear you anymore. We, we still can't quite hear you. Uh, no, not, not, not quite, no. Okay, I'm sorry, I'm, I need to fix something. Okay, no, no, no issues. Um, look, I think um, just sort of running through again, sure, it's been quite an interesting uh, conversation in the, in the chat side. Um, so let's just see if we can uh, bring a few of these up. Uh, Brittany, who sort of joined us earlier on, uh, uh, sort of excused herself, uh, says that she still has a set of uh, uh, the Britannica encyclopedia. So that, that's amazing. Um, uh, and Nico pointed out uh, the differences, um, you know, with how these waves are created from an AM and an FM perspective. Uh, Judy contributed something uh, there around uh, SCAR. Um, you know, so. If, if those of you that are interested in RF communications and um, and specifically astronomy, uh, you know, please do go ahead and click on that link that uh, was was ultimately shared. Um, Judy also pointed out Intelsat provides um, connectivity to airplane passengers using satellites, which is uh, which is absolutely amazing. Uh, I see Reza, you pointed out that 8888 is a DNS server. That's, uh, that's pretty, pretty good. That's, that's good of you to remember that. Um, you definitely are uh, probably on your way to becoming a network engineer from, from what it looks like. Um, and then we have um, Grace that's posed a question, you know, what is the difference between an S wave and a P wave? Um, I'm not sure from, from my perspective, I'm not too sure, Judy, uh, does that sound familiar to you or anybody else? Uh, do, you, do you want to do a sound check? Uh, yeah, how's that? Can you hear me now? <laughs> that's better, yes. Okay, great. Yeah, sorry, that's actually why I put my hand up. Um, uh, P waves travel through any kind of material, whether it's solid. Okay, propagation waves. On the other hand, um, S waves only move through solids. Okay, so... Um, yeah, that's all about the, the the type of the type of medium. So, yeah, um, if you wouldn't mind, I just quickly want to share my screen. Um, I want to go to Kibana, and um, yeah. So, sorry when I when I dropped out. Um, what I was just saying was that even though you can access Kibana uh, on your smartphone, um, really, it, it it doesn't display it doesn't display all of the functionality and all of the options. Um, and so I, I realized last night that a number of you who are really struggling with Kibana, please um, don't try to access it via your, your mobile phone, about via a smartphone. Please rather actually find a computer or a laptop to access it, because then you will see all of the different fields and, and you'll understand why you're getting stuck, because there, there's, there are a number of options that you're just you're not seeing on your smartphone and therefore you're getting really frustrated because it, it's just not working for you. Um, so what I've done is that I've gone here onto the SDG um, uh, uh, index. And then what I want to do is I just want to zoom in a little bit. Um, and we can see over here, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to, uh, I'm going to just 
so, no, I'm not going to worry about that. Um, so what we'll have, somebody's kit is obviously connected. Okay. Um, and if we open up, what we can see over here is we can see um, that, the, Colin, there should be an RSSI figure here, uh, which it is- was, It was here earlier uh, in the previous view, but yeah, it's gonna be here as well. There is at the bottom. They're right, right at the bottom. Okay, minus 76. So th this is an RSSI is radio signal strength indicator. And your Wi-Fi hub is actually a radio. It's a type of radio as, as Colin uh, shared with us. It's a, it's a type of wave. So what you could do is you could probably build a visualization that looked at the um, signal strength. So, so what you could do is you could probably go through and build a visualization. Um, maybe let's just quickly do that. Um, what we can do is we can say visualize and we can say add, add a new visualization. And what I'm going to do is that I'm actually going to just do it as a simple line chart. And it's from our SDG index. Okay. So when we open up here, uh, what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to look at, for it at my, uh, my own kit. Um, and uh, my kit has definitely been uh, connected in the last 60 days. So I'm going to do that and I'm going to say Y axis uh, for each tab. I just want to have average and then let's go right to the bottom RSSI. And I'm just going to say here RSSI. And then my I'm just going to have date histogram here. And let's run that. And let's see what. Wow, look at that. OK, so um, RSSI is usually um, referred to uh, in terms of a negative number. Um, and yeah, you can see that my radio signal strength has been varying considerably um, over, the, uh, over the last 60 days. Um, so what you could do is that you could actually uh, build a visualization like this. And you could move your kit around. You could move it away from your router, closer to your router. You could, uh, you know, maybe actually just, you know, if you cover it with something and then just take a photo so you've got a timestamp of which different material you have covering it. And then you can correlate that to, to your dashboard. So that's actually a very, very easy way um, to, uh, to, to run this. So what I'm going to do is that I'm actually going to save this. I'm going to save it as uh, RSSI uh, chart. Um, and then um, I'm just going to put over here that everybody needs to put their own kit name in, your kit name here. OK, and let's just save that. Judy, OK, yeah. Uh, I just want to quickly add while you have that graph still up. So, you know, as Judy pointed out, um, your received uh, signal strength indicator is a negative scale. And what that simply means is that the, the lower that number, right, it means the better your signal strength is. And as it gets, uh, so, um, so when I say lower, um, minus 40 is actually higher than minus 90, right? But, but just sort of bear in mind that uh, the closer it is to zero, the better the signal is. Um, the, the, the further it is away from zero, the worse your signal strength is. Great. Colin, yes, thank you. Thank you very much. So, yeah. Great. Um, yeah, so I think, uh, you know, I just want to say thanks to everybody uh, for sticking on till the end. Um, we'll, we'll certainly share a lot of this, um, the assignments will definitely go up onto the uh, the Canvas platform. Uh, we'll also then put up uh, the um, the PowerPoint presentation that I have. You'll find there's a lot more detail. There are some links for you to sort of go and explore, etc. But I just want to leave you with the fact that um, you know don't, don't let your learning stop here. Um, you know the idea was to sort of give you a sample set of of what's out there, uh, maybe give you sort of a high level view, but definitely go and and double click into each of those areas in, in your own time. 
Um, so yeah, that's it from my side, uh, Judy. Uh, over to you, I guess. Great, Colin, yes, thank you very much. Thank <laughs> you.